Well, I have with me today David Simos Brown, who is one of the founders and the strategy partner in a company called 100% Open. David, Sorry. thank you very much for talking with us. You're welcome, sir. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about where the company came from and where you see this uh, very interesting open innovation space. I certainly can. Um, we've been going about two and a half years now, and we're in fact a spin out of an organisation called NESTA, the National Endowment for Science, Technology mm -hmm. and the Arts. And we had, I had possibly the best job in the public sector for three years there, where we were tasked with creating new ways for the UK to innovate. So um, we alighted on um, open innovation and uh, the work, the early work that was going on mm -hmm. with Procter Gamble and Professor Chesborough and all those sorts of things. Well, that could be an interesting model for, mm. for the UK. Mm. Um, so we had a set of programmes over a three-year period which kind of experimented with different models, different ways of doing it, and being uh, part of the public sector and, and, and funded, we were able to then trial, pilot those, um, those models in, in real time with real businesses. Mm. Uh, so it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, so much so that uh, when our job was over at Nesta, there was sort of nothing left for us to do apart from spin out <laughs> and do it for money as well as love. So uh, that's how 100% Open mm. was founded. The space, it's interesting. I've often thought that working in open innovation is a bit like um, uh, being a wild west settler uh, in, 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 in the 18th century in America. It's like the wild west out here and um, there are very few uh, established methodologies, there are very few, you know, there's very little legal expertise when you need it, um, there are very few kind of companies that are culturally adept mm. to really opening up. Um, and that's not just from the point of view of big companies, small companies, SMEs and the general public have yet to really understand fully what open innovation mm. is all about. Mm. So it's a very exciting, very exciting uh, field. In fact, the first time in my life that I'm at the beginning of something interesting rather than the end of something <laughs> dull. So, so <laughs> one of my messages would be... Um, it's, it's this industry is a highly creative, creative mm. phase. So there's a thing called crowdsourcing, uh, which uh, people are getting very excited about. Um, it's led to um, a lot of uh, 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 mutual opportunity exploration between big companies um, mm. as well. Uh, so once you start opening up your thought process and realizing that not all the smart people work for us, you can look in various places for other smart people to collaborate with. So, and it's just started, really. Mm. I mean, that's. And could you give us a couple of examples of mm. the kind of thing you mean? Okay, um, I'm increasingly thinking of open innovation at four levels. Mm -hmm. So we'll go from no, we'll go from traditional to new. Okay. Traditional open innovation is between the Davids and the Goliaths of this world. So you have. Procter & Gamble, so our very first project with, was with p and mm -hmm. and we helped them publicly issue uh, a couple of interesting briefs to the UK design industry. And the UK design industry or SMEs um, submitted technologies or ideas uh, for a prize and a bit of funding. So that's the kind of classic yeah. uh, David and Goliath, so that's with SMEs. Um, Another project we did was with uh, Na uh, McLaren, their Formula One team. Mm -hmm. um, McLaren have a, a, a division called MAT, McLaren Applied Technologies. Mm -hmm. And one of the th their things um, that they like to do is, is realise value from, from the amazing innovation furnace that is, that is Formula One. Uh, so we managed to broker a partnership between them and NATS, the National Air Traffic Service, to wow. repurpose some racing software for airport control. Hmm. So that's the other level. So yeah. classic David Goliath. Then we've got um, what we call peer-to-peer -peer mm. uh, innovation, and that can lead to all sorts of interesting strategic opportunities and partnerships and mm. uh, and all that. And the third level, which is probably the most emergent level, is what we call customer co-creation. So it's increasingly apparent that big companies have an amazing untapped resource yeah. in their existing customers. So, for example, we've, this is our third project with E.ON now, the mm -hmm. power company. Yep. 
And uh, come next month, um, they've co-sponsored, they've sponsored a, a Channel 4 TV programme called Future Family. And it's all about how uh, a family will use the latest gadgets and gizmos and electrical stuff. Okay. Um, and at the end of that programme, they get a link to our co-creation website. Uh, where So we're engaging pretty much the whole of the UK. Uh, we're expecting something like 50,000 people on this site. Wow. Um, and they will be engaged and excited, I hope, by the programme content and then ask for their innovations and their um, builds on the things they've seen on, on the website. Mm. So we started that whole process um, in prototype with Eon's actual customers. Mm -hmm. so this, is, this is broadcast, but we started narrowcast with, yeah. with their customers. So we used a research panel, a pre-existing research panel, filtered those for creativity and entrepreneurialism, which uh, isn't that difficult and then engaged with these normal electricity consumers uh, who just you know, sat there and consumed electricity from, from the business's point mm -hmm. of view, but looked at them as rounded, interesting entrepreneurial individuals. And if you take any 100 electricity consumers, you'll have you know, two or three little bright sparks, mm. uh, pun intended, <laughs> who um, will be able to sell you stuff uh, mm. and uh, sell you services perhaps, or have come up with a new metering technology, or, or um, and that's what happened. So there's a, there's a sort of refocusing, I think, in terms of the relationships between big companies and their customers mm. uh, from, you know, me sell, you buy, to uh, uh, me sell, me buy, uh, if you like. Yeah. Uh, so um, that, and that I think is the leading edge. And, and the reason it's the leading edge is that you kill t at least two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. The first bird is innovation, the second one, is um, a sense of customer engagement. Yes, yes. So mm. what we found with our first project with Eon, called Power to the People, last year, in uh, 2010, um, was that we were getting a lot of sort of warmth, I guess, from, from, from the website. So we set up a website, mm. asked some interesting questions, and had you know, hundreds of uh, interesting ideas back. Mm. But because these are a little like social media spaces, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of chat, a lot of kind of um, meeting and bonding, and it's always great if the client, the, the company is uh, obviously there and listening. Mm. And therefore, you know, new relationships form. Uh, people's idea of Eon as a big faceless you know, corporation, if they have that idea, is rapidly dispelled. And their um, net promoter score starts uh, increasing. Um, Interesting. And, uh, and they start recommending Eon to their friends, and that, the whole saliency of that brand and that relationship goes, goes sky high. So this year, um, our client uh, is half innovation and half marketing. So actually what's yeah. happening is we're turning a customer co-creation piece. Yes, we're, we're farming lots of great ideas, their innovation uh, pipeline, but we're also creating new, warmer relationships with, with customers and potential customers. Yeah. Yeah. And the third un unexpected and emergent area is internal co-creation. Uh, all of our clients have now, bar one, asked us for an internal ideation platform where they can use a kind of uh, social media uh, approach of putting comments, asking questions, getting mm. answers, ranking, voting, building. Uh, I've asked for that um, to help unite functions and, and divisions and silos within businesses. So the craft skills of external open innovation mm. are rapidly being internalized for uniting and rewiring the brains of massive corporations uh, oh. globally. So that's, that's actually very exciting. Um, there's an example which has been going for five years now at Orange, uh, mm -hmm. or France Telecom, and they have a system called Idee Click, uh, mm -hmm. idea, click, you click, you have an idea. <laughs> um, and it's brilliant, it saved, them almost, saved or made them almost a billion euros over the five years. Uh -huh. It has 30,000 employees that um, are almost daily engaged, so it's a third of the workforce. And um, it's evolved into an amazing system where it's not just I have an idea, I'll, 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 mm. I'll upload it. It's involved, it's involved into the entire project management system. So the idea, if it's any good, gets farmed out to the relevant um, technical or, or, or customer specialist. It then gets taken forward into prototype, 
uh, and, and execute it. So it's actually... Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's an innovation system, not just an it's idea. It's an entire thing. innovation system. Mm. And it's become a peer-to-peer... Um, uh, it's a peer-to-peer support mechanism as well. So, say, telephone operator X says, you know, I've got an issue with these clients, I can't understand. There was, there was an issue um, with someone who, who didn't... Um, with a lot of English customers, and it's France, remember, mm-hmm. and she couldn't understand, her English wasn't good enough, so, so she suggested, what, uh, why don't we have some English speakers in the, uh, in, in the call centre? Uh, and yes, they did that, and then they trained them uh, on English mm-hmm. uh, and all that. So there's lots of kind of real, and, but it was colleagues that responded to her yeah. initially, yeah. so there's a sort of, how can you help me? So it's turned from idée uh, clique to j'ai un quai, which any French people out there will realize ah. is a pun. Uh, G1K, J1K, but J1K means I have a case or I have yep. a problem, can you help me? So they call it J1K. Uh, so what they've done is they've, t- they've turned an internal ideation platform where people just submit mm-hmm. you know, what used to be called um, suggestions box. Yes. Uh, but they've turned it into an integrated, budgeted, controlled system for, for, uh, for amazing internally generated innovation. So, ah. It's funny, I started talking about open innovation. You would imagine that one could describe that as closed innovation, but at least it's internal. Mm. But it relies on, a lot, relies on a lot of the same skill sets. Absolutely. Of, of collaboration. Yeah. And in large organisations, they're as diffuse as uh, sort of population. So in that sense, bringing them together yeah. wouldn't normally happen in one site. Absolutely, absolutely. David, it's fascinating in terms of the, the emergent opportunities and also this moving frontier. Mm. It can't be without its problems. I wonder if you could comment a bit on some of the challenges you see. I can. Um, I've got two obvious ones and two surprising ones, mm-hmm. uh, I think, for you. Well, they might be surprising. <laughs> uh, and the obvious one you'll expect me to trot out is intellectual property. Mm. So do we have the IP regimes? Do we have the business models? Do we have the kind of you know, lawyers that are nice enough in, in companies uh, that will allow very unequal partners to mm-hmm. create mm-hmm. mutual value? No, in most cases. So there's a new, there's a new skill set required, a new skill set um, of creative business model making, allied with, you know, not, not a flexible approach to the law, because that's that would be wrong. <laughs> but it's, but it's slightly more yeah, creative. Uh, what would be the what would be the equivalent of creative accounting, uh, creative lawyering? I don't yeah, know what it yeah. is, but but at least, at least you know. So um, and. Um, and that's from both sides. Mm. SMEs need to get much smarter about what they own, what they can own, yeah. and, and, and what the deal is. However, broadly speaking, I would have said that open innovation teaches us one thing. It teaches us that it's uh, not about uh, ownership. It's about delivery, mm. execution. <clears throat> so who cares who owns it as long as we both make money out of it? Yeah. And an yeah. approach like that, then a lot of the legal issues kind of go away because you're not arm wrestling over something that's wrong. You know, over, over a mere title deed, mm-hmm. you're, you're actually having a constructive commercial conversation about who's going to profit yeah. from this thing and how. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing, IP. Um, uh, the second obvious thing is that is access. So um, it's from the corporation's point of view very inefficient to have a whole bunch of scouts and a whole bunch mm-hmm. of people in different territories and different markets, and you know, mm. have relationships with fifteen different universities around the globe. It takes a lot of time and it's very inefficient. It is, it is almost literally um, hunting for a, a needle in a haystack to try and find a technology yeah. or yeah. company you can do business with. And from the point of view of a small business, most of the big doors you find yourself uh, approaching are, are closed or unmarked or, or slammed <laughs> in your face. So how do you find yeah. the right door and how do you open it and how do you get it to stay open? Uh, so all those are problems of access. Yeah. And some of that is ameliorated by, you know, intermediaries such as Innocentive, who, who, who have mm. created a little mini marketplace so people can kind of understand what's there and go there. Yeah. But that is all very um, nascent, that whole thing. So there will be, I predict this because we're going to do it, uh, <laughs> there will be um, market, market, there will be networks that are created that are bespoke to different companies. The two themes that are less obvious uh, are culture and process. So what we're finding is, um, if 
a company will have a culture that's adept at opening up or in some way predisposed to opening up, it doesn't have the right processes. And it, a company often will invent a new process for opening up and then find, find, that, find that it doesn't work because mm. they lack the, the right cultural characteristics. So, um, there's a, I think there's a, there's a kind of collaborate. so talking about culture first, I think there's a kind of collaboration intelligence question mm. that, 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 mm. you, that you need. And um, there are certain collaboration skills that, that, that we're teaching, if you like, that involve um, personal attributes and also company attributes. So culture, if you define culture as what we do around here, then if you don't do open innovation, then it's, it's obvious that yeah. you're not going to be culturally adept at mm -hmm. <laughs> doing yeah, it around here. So what happens first? Okay, first somebody gets given the job of uh, Open Innovation Director, or maybe someone from R&D decides to put a brief out, or maybe something else happens. And all goes terribly well until they put the brief out. Then, then one of two or three things happens. They get a call from the marketing team, uh, or the PR team, mm -hmm or their boss's boss is boss. Because suddenly this thing has got external visibility. Mm. And the lesson from that is gain alignment through talking to colleagues in the expected and the unexpected areas. So our first project with Orange, uh, which is called Oscar, our client there, Jogesh Limbani, who's now head of open innovation at mm -hmm. Orange UK, is one of life's connectors. So the core skill you need to make open innovation work in a business isn't technical, really, uh, isn't legal. <clears throat> it is um, all about communicating effectively mm -hmm. with colleagues across the, across the business. So Jogesh assembled the right team at Orange that meant that we wouldn't hit any hurdles later. So all the right people were brought in and had an input to the process yeah. and all the right people were kind of uh, Informed. So that included M&A, Merchants and Acquisitions people, that included UK Marketing, it included R&D, it included people from France who had veto, rights of veto, so one, he created the team uh, which meant that they could be receptive to external yeah. innovations. Yeah. And the result of that project was, um, was a, uh, uh, it's now a, tri a trial of, of um, a service called Last Second Tickets, uh, which is uh, mobile phone enabled um, uh, uh, system which enables you to go and see gigs at the last minute mm. in an area near you. So it's a perfect Great. fit for Orange. Absolutely. But, but that required technical skills to adapt it to their system. It required kind of legal and business modeling skills to mm. know how the deal mm -hmm. was going to pan out. Uh, it included um, uh, marketing skills to know which segment this would target best at and how that would promote yeah. loyalty or whatever. Uh, and it required um, R&D skills to for technical um, due diligence and all that sort of thing. So, it's, so open innovation is, is great until you, until you start <laughs> and, then gets, and then it gets complicated. Yeah. So culturally, um, you know, the thing, to, so, so yeah, personally you, you need to be a connector mm. and, and then your culture needs to accept those connections. Yeah. So with this orange team that I, I, I mentioned, it was the first time they'd ever been in a room together, these guys. So, uh, and that once it, worked, worked very well. So that's sort of culture. Um, oh yes, uh, there are, so the second aspect of culture is, is, uh, is, is, um, is skills and personnel. So increasingly we find that we're dealing with HR people as well as marketing people, as well as innovation people. Uh, mm. Because the skills required to implement open innovation across the business are different yes. and you yes. might want to hire different people. You certainly will want to train them differently and you will probably mm. want to motivate them differently mm. as well. So one of the things that occurs at some point in that cultural journey is, oh, can we spin out? Or uh, do you have a venturing arm that we could um, uh, profit see, from? Yeah. Or um, don't fire me, um, give me some real IP and technology and I'll, I'll bring mm. some value back. So there are all sorts of creative ways of, of creating a different contract between employer and employee as an innovation. So it's much more entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Can, as soon as you let the outside in, mm. all sorts of interesting things happen with, mm. uh, like that, I think, or will. Um, so there's this, there's a kind of motivational piece, but there's also the skill sets. Um, so are people good negotiators? Are they good communicators? Are they good 
um, uh, do, 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 they, do they have listening skills? You know, how many people in business are great at listening? Fewer than you might imagine. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole cultural piece, mm. which is interesting. <clears throat> in fact, our last, our last contract, I can't say who it is for, but it was essentially a uh, cultural transformation uh, uh, piece. Um, in fact, no, I can tell you this. Um, uh, David Richard, a uh, guy Orange, mm -hmm. France, who runs ID Click, he says something like, it's a cultural transformation program masquerading as an innovation engine. So his mm. whole um, approach to that is it's about uniting a company, getting it talking, uh, getting it helping mm. each other, getting it to sort of relate in a much more meaningful mm. and positive mm. way. So, so yeah, open innovation will often transform culture without kind of meaning to. Uh, <laughs> That's a fairly big one, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely. Uh, and the second unexpected one is, um, is process. Mm -hmm. And it's unexpected because at the beginning of this, I said open innovation is like the Wild West. We're kind of making it up uh, in many respects as we go along, you know, creatively and uh, carefully. So if it is like that, how can we have processes? Well, I think people will need to um, understand the scope of open innovation. Mm. So, uh, and, and to a certain extent, the flavors of open innovation too. Because if, you, if your image of open innovation is simply, you know, small company knocks on big company's door, does yeah. a deal, then, then there's no need for process. But mm. I've outlined four different levels, yep. right from external to internal, uh, the, the, the different cultural attributes you need, um, and the types of things you innovate as well are very varied. So they can be product, they can be service, they can be product with a service wrap, uh, they can be, you can give birth to new companies, mm -hmm. new legal entities, new brands, uh, you, know, you know, anything from a, from a half-form concept to, to, to a, to a fully functioning and, and a market tested prototype. So the, the, the stuff of open innovation is very varied mm -hmm. uh, and very, um, yeah, very, uh, very diverse. So, so you need some processes to get your head around it. And we try and make it simple, perhaps over simple, by saying there are two flavors of open innovation. There's a kind of um, qualitative uh, uh, flavor, which we call jam. Uh, and, that, and that is, as the name might suggest, um, fairly intimate, quite creative, pretty much workshop-based, mm -hmm. works best between people of equal stature, companies mm -hmm. of equal size, um, and tends to result in, in, in external routes to market, so um, joint ventures, uh, things we do out there yeah. together. That's the jam. And then Discover is more quantitative. It's more to do with the crowdsourcing end of things. So it's where you put a brief out to a very large number of people or companies, and then it's more competitive. So you will select winners from, from that process. So Jam is more collaborative, Discover is more competitive, and uh, that competition results in a winner, and then the deal is done uh, as a result of that. Discover's tend to result in internal routes to market. So it's about us acquiring a technology from the outside, um, or a bunch of people from the outside, mm -hmm. And then plugging into our into our processes, so it's helpful. I think to think of the spectrum uh, from from qualitative, collaborative, jam to quantitative, competitive, discover, and of course mm. there's stuff in the middle uh, as well. Mm. So that's in terms of tools, um, that's the, that's the landscape. So we have two main main tools, but there are some specific things that, that address the cult, the issues I was talking about earlier. So in terms of intellectual property, it's a thing. Uh, a tool we use called Airlock, uh, which is where there's a confidential bubble <coughs> uh, mm. around um, the uh, submitter of the intellectual property, such that they can't then communicate directly with the big company, uh, which obviates all sorts of issues. Yes, yes. Um, so the big company wants some IP, but it can't. It's, a lot of them don't have confidential conversations. So there's a blocker there. So there are, there are certain techniques like that that can get you out of that mm -hmm. particular sort of bind. And then we act as trusted agents on behalf of the SME, and we act in loco parentis for the big company. So we know what they want. We make sure we know what they want, yeah. and we make sure they get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't have to see it first. So there, there, are, there are devices like Airlock um, that, that help. Um, and there are other tools that we're developing really on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, such as um, 
in internal ideation platforms mm -hmm. for different people. Um, so yeah, so the, the last un, unexpected area is processes. People will try and sell you processes for open innovation, but I'd be a bit suspicious about that <laughs> because you know, if people aren't at least half making it up, then they're not, they're not mm -hmm. doing a decent job in such an emergent marketplace, yes. I would say. David, that's absolutely fascinating, and it's, in a sense, it's it's not reinventing innovation, but it's certainly translating it into a, a 21st century network version. Absolutely, very, very interesting. Yeah. I wonder, perhaps, just one last comment, if we could ask you, um, if you were giving some advice based on your considerable experience, um, if you're giving some advice to somebody who's just been given the job of innovation manager, yeah. um, and perhaps is beginning to look at the open innovation challenge, what advice might you give them? Well, I think, um, in line with my comments earlier about uh, our friend Jogesh at, at Orange, mm -hmm. is that the key skill is to, is to connect with colleagues. So think about open innovation from every department's point of view. So if you're uh, uh, running a factory and you are thinking about supply chain, for example, um, what help can you be to the manager of that supply chain? How can you say, okay, Let's put your processes out of tender, let's mm -hmm. in, you know, invite some new technologists in and listen to people um, across the business, across the business uh, finding what pain points they have and, and inventing some you know, uh, ointment to, 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 to rub on those pain, pain points. So and I, I, I've seen this happen last year amongst, across a, different, a whole bunch of different companies. So, think, think, so open innovation isn't just about kind of front end ideation. It, it can be fundamental to how the business transforms itself. So look at supply chain, um, look at marketing. Marketing are your friends in, in open innovation, or they soon will be when it gets out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that includes public relations and digital marketing and social media and all that kind of stuff, all integrated. Uh, be very friendly with your intellectual property people, your lawyers. Um, get as senior sponsorship as you possibly can, because if you suddenly wander into a company and say, well, you know, you, you need a new business model, then you'll be talking <laughs> to the top guy uh, fairly soon. Uh, so why not start with yeah. the top guy? So, so I think the attribute you need is, is to be a connector and um, really um, actual self into a new way of thinking. Um, by that I mean, as an open innovator, you'll be, you'll be living open innovation. So you'll be collecting ideas like a magpie from across the business. You'll be finding value in unexpected corners. You'll be recombining technologies mm -hmm. and, and, and ideas and people. Uh, and you'll be living, you'll be a living embodiment of the open innovation methodology in, in many ways. In order to do that, you have to, be, you have, to have friends in all, all the right places across the business. That's, that would be my advice. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, David. If people want to find out more, of course, they can look at your website, and there's a lot more information about 100% Open. There is, yes. 100open.com, lots of case studies, uh, blogs, pretty good, even though it says myself. <laughs> uh, and a lot of this stuff you'll find uh, on the blog in, in slightly um, uh, more ordered fashion. Wonderful. David, thank you very much for talking to You're us. Welcome, thank you.